Hello there, sword fans. Today I'm going to tell you about this sword right here. This is a hand and a half sword from Sabersmith. It's like a medieval interpretation of a hand and a half sword or a long sword, perhaps. And uh, it also has this kind of accessory scabbard. Now, this is from Sabersmith. If you're unfamiliar with their wares, I will link them in the description down below so you can go and find them. I'm familiar with Sabersmith from the Minnesota Renaissance Festival. That's usually where I've gotten a chance to handle some of their stuff. And over the years, I've gone into their shop and I've handled a series of blades, and they all have kind of a well, a similar theme in terms of how they're ground and, and aesthetics and things like that. And while they make a lot of different types of swords from a lot of different iterations and cultures and time periods and such, uh, they all have this kind of similar contemporary look, kind of modern contemporary-ish look to them that, that seems to flow throughout the, the line that they have. Um, there's a lot of different colors and options and stuff that you can get on the sword, and namely, Swordfriend Arthur has made a series of videos and swords that he picked up from Sabersmith, so while the topic is fresh and while Renaissance Fest Festival season is coming up, I thought maybe this was a good time to, to do this video. Uh, I'm not going to do a whole lot in this review, just bear in mind I, I cut a couple things with it, but uh, this sword is, is really well built, or rather stoutly built. It's made to, to take on some punishment, and that's not what I put it through. I cut a couple bottles, and it doesn't showcase maybe where this sword would excel the most, but I can show you some of the aesthetics and things like that, so that's what I'm going to do in the video. Uh, do bear in mind that this sword retails for about $675, nearest I can tell. This one may be less expensive, given that its kind of hilt is maybe a little less intricate than some of the options that I see online, but right now I can't find the spot on their website where I can kind of customize and pick out what this sword would actually cost now, but I see the options right now online. They look like about $675, bucks, so they do contain maybe more ornate bluing and stuff on the handle, which likely I, I would speculate anyway, based on what I saw in Arthur's video, cost more. Uh, anyway, so as I'm thinking about the sword, $675 is my price point, plus $100 for this scabbard bit here, which appears to be a birch scabbard with a kind of leather frog on it to hold on your belt. And obviously, these things are a medieval artistic contemporary interpretation. They don't, they're not trying to make or advertising them as historically accurate swords. They're just kind of fun things, and they're often sold at Renaissance festivals. So at least that's where I see them sold. They're sold, you know, to, to people that are, are looking for fun things for the costume, but maybe want a fun stout thing. But these aren't necessarily geared towards practitioners or competitions or historical accuracy. They're made to look cool and kind of uh, be handed to a novice that can hit things and hopefully it stands up to some <laughs> bad cuts, I suppose, would be the thing against, you know, seemingly unknown targets. Who knows what people are gonna hit with them, but usually branches in the backyard tend to be a popular one. So uh, I think as it is, it's supposed to be 1075 steel, uh, through hardened is, is what it appears to be to kind of a spring temperature. They do that in-house supposedly and I say all that supposedly because that's what they advertise and I just don't have a way of substantiating it. Not that I, I doubt it. Um, I did throw some bad cuts the way of this sword and it remained straight, uh, but it's not particularly sharp so it doesn't cut exceedingly well, though the hollow ground geometry on it does surprisingly, if given enough force, move through a pool noodle better than I expected. Uh, I'll talk about that in just a moment. But anyway, frame of reference for me, $675 plus $100 for this game. We're talking about uh, 700 almost $800 for, for this package, and, uh, and that's what we're going to look at. Now, I'm going to start with the pommel. Uh, what I see is this <laughs> Dungeons & Dragons style, D20 style die, which is, it's certainly got more facets than that, and it's irregular and not... Uh, shaped exactly in any any particular style other than generally round with some facets on it. Uh, all of the edges have been smoothed out in such a way that it doesn't hurt my hand. There's nothing uncomfortable about holding it. And frankly, the shape is, is surprisingly comfortable to hold in the hand. It, it uh, rests well in my palm. I feel like I get traction on it more than I would if it was simply a metal ball and it has a certainly more interesting appearance at least it does to me though it would be nice if it had a little bit more i guess symmetry or a little a little more consistent pattern given that the cross seems to have a pattern that is relatively consistent but maybe that's just this particular pommel what what i can say though is that it's actually surprisingly comfortable in the hand generally i don't like wheel pommels which this is kind of a a type of i guess but it doesn't hurt the flub of my hand it's overall a very very comfortable design so in terms of <laughs> pragmatic practical application it, it does the job uh it, it's not even though it shows tool markings sand markings and mine has rusted a little bit which is likely not how it came from the factory but there were some kind of tool markings and things like that in here so it's not pristine exactly but uh for what you get it's a you know silvery steel ball with a bunch of facets on it that remains comfortable in the hand uh, as it is, it's not particularly large. It doesn't act as necessarily much of a counterweight either. This sword, uh, talking about the palm limit and movement and balance, it, it's balanced, you know, about three inches above the cross section here, um, or the cross guard here. 
and it's also three pounds, three ounces, or, or thereabouts. I'll put specifications in the description down below. Uh, the important thing to note about that is that is a very heavy sword for, you know, just under, over 27 inch blade. Um, that could be, you know, that's not all that much lighter than like the Albion Prince Bay or, or a big type 18 giant cutting sword. So to have a 27 inch blade rather than like a 36 inch blade uh, on a three pound sword, that's, it's, it's suffice to say pretty heavy, uh, but those are historical proportions. This is not that, and this because it has a basically a point of balance brought in uh, by the weight of this this hilt. It feels still reasonably nimble, though you can certainly feel the heft in the hand. Uh, anyway, I'm going to move on to the the grip here, and this is also something that I I, I happen to really like. Um, it has this kind of hex. I don't know this interpretation of like a Japanese style. Uh, wrap on it, which isn't maybe quite fair because I've seen European swords with kind of similar stuff on them. But the material here, given that mine is older and secondhand, has held up really well. It doesn't move around. It also has kind of a cool, kind of sinew esque kind of uh, pattern on the surface of it. I, I really happen to like it. And the the way the leather is wrapped around, my fingers kind of find natural positions to rest in. And just about anywhere I hold the sword is is pretty comfortable. It has kind of a, a copper wound. Uh, string wrap in the middle and this reminds me of kind of a battle wrap on a Japanese sword or as, as we call it but uh, honestly any spot that I put the sword is comfortable it seems to have a hexagonal section to it though there's not any taper it remains a pretty consistent thickness and width all the way across uh, but overall it has like a raised center ridge there's just more depth and dimension here than I honestly expected in a kind of loose interpretation of a sword and it's honestly more comfortable than I expected and the wrap has remained relatively tight usually on these medieval renaissance festival things the leather comes loose or, or something like that or it doesn't necessarily have a lot of depth or dimension or shape or texture to appreciate and I see all that here well I, well, I might appreciate some tapering and wasting um, Overall, I can't argue that it is both comfortable in the hand and it's held up well over time. This has gone through temperature and garages and stuff like that. I got it secondhand from somebody who didn't necessarily take particularly good care of it. And so it wouldn't surprise me uh, if, if this were loose, but it's it's overall, it's held up really well. And I just happen to like the aesthetics of it. It's, it's a handsome looking, looking blade or handsome looking grip overall. And namely some of the options that I've seen from Sword for Arthur on the screen, they don't necessarily look all that elaborate, but in person, kind of the way they wrap the wire and you know the, the way these are done up, I, I think it's a, a fun look and more importantly, it's certainly practical. And that's what transitions to the rest of the sword. The pommel, a historic certainly, but practical and feels comfortable in the hand, the grip as well. Uh, the cross guard here is very, <laughs> very thick and robust. I like that the edges are all smoothed and rounded, but it also has kind of wasting and shape, and it's all symmetrical and, and reasonably reasonably well done. It's rusted a little bit, or at least mine has, but what I do see here is some attempt at aesthetics and depth and dimension in terms of shape. It's not just a solid bar. It's been wound down, and it's all been kind of sanded out in such a way that it doesn't hurt the user. So in terms of functionality, tip of my hat, but it is more robust perhaps than it needs to be unless i guess it's fencing against uh, one of these other very thickly <laughs> thickly built swords uh, but as it is it's certainly aesthetically if you like it or not there you know i guess I, it, that's a purely subjective thing it just could be smaller to my eye this this could be not as as dense as it is and it might save a little bit on the weight though probably not it wouldn't change all that much in terms of the dynamics um, gap in the cross guard this looks like it's milled and it's not it has reasonably tight tolerances around the blade, but there's, I don't know, probably about a two millimeter gap on either side of where the blade rests. Um, the other bit I want to note about kind of cross guard is how you hold it. If I choke up on the grip, it's comfortable. If I place my hand in the middle, it's comfortable. If I hold it with two hands, it's comfortable. If I wrap a hand around, it's comfortable. If I put my thumb here, it's comfortable. And there's, there's, you can hold it just about any way you want, and it, it provides a level of, <laughs> a level of comfort. It's pretty user friendly for, for all the criticism I, I might get about it, uh, being too thick and, and stout. It does, it is ergonomic at least in, in that regard. Anyway, I'm going to move on to the blade, and the blade has one particularly interesting characteristic in that it's hollow ground and that seems to be the case on a va the vast majority of these swords from Sabersmith is the way they, they grind them has a big hollow ground edge and that's one thing I noticed when I was looking at some of the katanas and things like that in blades that don't conventionally or historically haven't had hollow ground edges. Uh, many of them seem to have that and it 
I'm speculating probably aided in when I was cutting the pool noodle. Generally speaking, this is not particularly sharp. It's sharp enough that I could cut myself, but pool, noodle, pool noodles, generally speaking, as I cut them, require a very, very keen edge to kind of whip through. And this one was batting it around. One side is, is a little sharper than the other, but when given enough force and good edge alignment, it did move through the pool noodle, which I was kind of surprised by, given that this, this level of sharpness is not... Um, hasn't been historically su sufficient for me to move through pool noodles in the past. So I, bet I did find that surprising. Water bottles proved to be the same thing. I was batting them around at first, but with enough chutzpah behind the cut and reasonable edge alignment, it did move through and it, it cut. And I think part of that must be related to the geometry. We have a very pronounced secondary bevel, but there's a hollow ground section in here and it, I, can't, I can't deny that it surprised me a little bit in the cut. I did have to put more chutzpah in it than uh, then I, I think I should have to, but if I were keen, keening up the edge and I put a razor edge on it, I have no doubt that it would it would likely cut better than it did, and I wouldn't have to have to put as much momentum behind the blade to do it. Uh, other notes, there are kind of wobblies in the edge, so I don't know how these are made. If they're machined out, it certainly looks like they're they're done largely with, with a mill or something like that based on how I see the, the fuller put in, but there are kind of hand touches in it. One hand, one side has less ripples in the surface than the other, uh, the edge and lines wander ever so slightly. It's not a perfectly stamped out blade. It has some some remnants of human interaction on the blade, but overall, I mean, it's it's a pretty simple thing. The the hollow ground is certainly the 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 part that stands out most to me. And then um, kind of where the fullers terminate and things like that, it's just not perfectly even or symmetrical. So if you're looking for perfect symmetric symmetry and things like that, I don't see that the edge does wander the the tip section does wander a little bit not not so much that you pick it out just at a distance but when you really try to get up close and you you're looking for flaws i suppose you can find them anyway it also has a satin finish there's not any kind of mirror polishing or anything like that on here so in terms of cutting things uh it <laughs> it doesn't show scratches and things like that and it was relatively easy to clean as well i will i will also say that i put a little kind of metal polish on it and the gunk cleaned off pretty easily and i don't see the scratches and things like that which you would know more than likely notice if it had a more elaborate polish on it um, anyway that's the blade it's pretty stiff as well you can see it doesn't have <laughs> much of any flex to it it's also flexing in the center of the blade which is maybe not great it'd be better if that flex had uh, had a little bit more towards the top i don't see any distal taper here or any taper really here there might be some but if it is it's it's relatively minor and i'm not seeing it it's it's basically a ground out thick um you know bar I, i'm not sure exactly how it's made if it's milled or ground uh either way i suppose it would be ground but i'm not sure if it's done by hand or how much of it is done by hand Anyway, there's not a lot of taper. There's not a lot of flex. The point is very pointy. It feels reasonably controllable. I'm not gonna include the weapon dynamics here because it's time consuming and I don't want to. Uh, the node appears to be right about in the cutting plane of the blade. And dynamically speaking, it's it's for its size, more comfortable in the hand than I would expect, but you certainly, certainly feel the heft. Anyway, I'm gonna move on to the scabbard. There's not a whole lot to talk about here. This is a birch scabbard that has been painted or lacquered black with a leather frog on it, and it is not not good. Um, <laughs> but wait, I mean, I do have to keep in mind that this is a $100 scabbard, and so as it is, it's really more of a shipping container or something to hold the sword if you don't want to spend more. For $100, it does not seem to be a bad deal. I know that's a lot of money for something very, very simple, but all that still costs money. Uh, it doesn't hold it, it doesn't retain it, but it also doesn't scratch it, and it comes with a way to uh, harness it on your belt. But I think if you were to take on a custom project, you could certainly make a scabbard that is uh, better suited. And it's a shame that I don't see more elaborate scabbards offered. It'd be nice to kind of maintain some kind of continuity between the metal fittings and some of the, uh, some of the materials and stuff used on the sword, because they're interesting, and they just, I don't know, it seems like the scabbard is beneath the quality of, of the sword. and All right, so the point about the scabbard is that I think it cheapens the experience. It's not a bad deal as for lacquered birch, and honestly, what you're getting here, as simple as it is, it would be tough to find a sheath or another another thing online uh, that might fit <laughs> even worse and, and offer a worse experience for $100. So I don't think it's a bad deal, but it's certainly the materials and the aesthetic are cheaper and kind of beneath what I'm seeing in the sword here. Incidentally, I don't know if Sabersmith offers more elaborate customizations for scabbards. Perhaps they do. It'd be interesting to see, though I'd imagine not too many people are keen on picking them up. I can imagine at a Renaissance festival, people pick up the sword, they're enamored 
bothered with it. They want to buy it. They see a price tag of almost $700 for the sword itself. And then to also have to pair it with a scabbard that was $700, which is likely what it would probably cost to have kind of more similar fittings and materials and time invested into it. I, I imagine it's probably just not a popular seller, and that's why uh, things like this are, are popular. $100 for a scabbard seems reasonable to folks, but more than that maybe maybe is a, is a tougher sell. So uh, anyway, it, it's entirely possible. It'd just be cool to see see some of the uh, a scabbard with, with similar hilt furniture that matched and meshed up a little better because I do like the aesthetic. It has a particular style and flair to it. It would be nice to see it flow through uh, the, the rest of the scabbard. Though, I, again, I imagine that would bring the package price up to $1,400 instead of $800 for the package or thereabouts. Anyway, that gets me to the point, do I personally think the sword is worth it or not? All right, sword friends, uh, it's a tough question to answer. Is it worth it or not, honestly? And that's because I see value here. There are a lot of features here. I don't think it's a ripoff. I like the company. I like the products. I think they're cool. I'm just not the audience for it. This particular one, specifically, I got it secondhand to try out Sabersmith stuff. But to me, this one is like a, um, a more ergonomic version of the Conan the Barbarian sword and that it's short for its weight it's half the weight of that of that sword but proportionally it's actually somewhat similar and it's still too heavy and i don't particularly like moving it around i can't deny that in looking over it i found lots of stuff to appreciate and it makes me want to maybe try something like the katana stuff from sabersmith because i'm more familiar with that type of sword one but two as i recall being there they were closer in proportion and dynamics to katana that i'm used to uh, then, then maybe this one is for for what it is at, at three pounds three ounces. It's not ridiculous. It's just not not particularly fun. And, and the theme and the style and the artistry. Well, I like it. It doesn't necessarily make me want to keep the sword. And it's I prefer I think historical things. As I think about what I would rather spend money on, you know, if I if I was looking for a European style sword, I would probably go the route of a dark sword army. As I recall, the Alexandria sword with scabbard was very similar in price to this. And, uh, and I, I liked swinging that one around more. It felt more fun in my hand, and I, I, it also had kind of hollow ground edges and interesting stuff to look at, and so that, that would probably be the direction I would go. But this, if you're looking for something robust, I bet these quillins are going to hold up better. I bet it would be you know, more durable and, and all of that kind of stuff, regardless of what you were swinging it at. And if you're not a student of historical martial arts or you don't really care about the, the dynamics and historical accuracy of it, you're looking for a sword that's cool looking and looks good on your on your Ren garb, then I don't think these are a bad deal. I don't think they're a ripoff. And honestly, there's a lot more to appreciate here than I, than I expected. It's just not for me personally. Anyway, I hope that's helpful. That's all I have for you. I will link uh, Swordfriend Arthur's reviews for another uh, another perspective and more Sabersmith stuff to look at and the website in the description down below. If you have any questions, uh, throw them in the comments section. That's all I've got for you. Hopefully the video has been interesting. As always, cheers and thanks for watching.